Well, hello dragons and welcome to this instructional video for lesson seven, part five, US Banking Today. The main idea behind this economics lesson is the banking choices of Americans has expanded to include a wide variety of financial institutions. With that in mind, by the end of watching this video, you'll be able to identify the most common types of US financial institutions, explain how automation has affected banking practices, identify and describe the results of banking deregulation, and explain the crises that financial institutions faced in the late 1980s. Now that the outcomes for this lesson have been shared with you, let's get started. As you have learned, the U.S. banking system has changed dramatically over time. Changes such as home banking and debit cards continue to take place all around you. Recently, the three main trends in banking have been automation, deregulation, and stabilization of the banking industry. Before looking at these trends, however, you must be able to identify the players in the field, the financial institutions. Today you have many banking options. Suppose that you decide to open a savings account. You visit each of the several different financial institutions located near your home to find out what services are offered. Soon your mind is whirling with interest rates, regular savings accounts, money market accounts, and certificates of deposit. How do you choose among financial institutions? What do you want to know about these institutions before handing over your hard-earned money? Four major types of financial institutions have emerged as the U.S. banking system has evolved. For many years, these institutions offered different services and different interest rates. Today, however, they are much more similar in their services and functions. The most common types of financial institutions have included commercial banks, savings and loan associations, mutual savings banks, and credit unions. In 2019, nearly 11,000 commercial banks existed in the United States. The main functions of commercial banks today are to lend money, accept deposits, and transfer money among businesses, other banks and financial institutions, and individuals. Commercial banks make almost 40% of all mortgage loans and almost 50% of all other loans. In the 1800s, commercial banks developed as institutions for business and commerce. In the early 1900s, however, commercial banks began to offer services to individuals. Today, commercial banks generally offer customers the widest range of services of all financial institutions. Like commercial banks, savings and loan associations, or SNLs, were established to lend money and accept deposits. Sometimes called thrifts, these savings and loan associations were begun as home-building societies in the mid-1800s. Members deposited money into a large general fund and took turns borrowing it and paying it back until each member was able to build a house. Today, the nation has nearly 2,000 SNLs. Individuals and families continue to make up the majority of SNL customers. Federal regulations and laws allowed SNLs to expand enabling them to offer many of the same services available at commercial banks, such as credit cards and insured deposits. Interest rates, both on savings accounts and on loans, vary among savings institutions. In the early 1800s, institutions called mutual savings banks were set up to serve people who wished to make small deposits that large commercial banks did not want to handle. Like an SNL, business for a mutual savings bank traditionally came from personal savings and home mortgage loans. Interest rates for loans at mutual savings banks often were slightly lower than those at commercial banks. Employees of large businesses and institutions and members of large labor unions often belong to credit unions. Today, approximately 11,700 credit unions are in operation in the United States. When credit union members deposit money, they purchase shares that pay interest. Credit unions use this savings pool to supply low-cost loans to their members. 
Credit unions usually offer higher interest rates on savings and lower interest rates on loans than do other financial institutions. Personal, automobile, and home improvement loans account for the majority of the loan activity. Three main trends have influenced financial institutions in recent years. The first trend is automation, which means reliance on computers to handle transactions. Also called electronic funds transfer, or EFT, automated banking increases banks' efficiency by allowing them to execute banking transactions electronically. The process allows transactions to affect accounts immediately. It saves banks money by decreasing the number of workers needed for banking operations. The four main types of automated banking are automated teller machines, automatic clearinghouse services, point-of-sale terminals, and home banking. Are you among the millions of people who use an automated teller machine or ATM to deposit or withdraw money from a bank account? If not, you probably know someone who is. In August 2019, more than 217 million ATM cards were in circulation. Those ATM cards, if laid end-to-end, -end, would stretch across the United States from coast to coast four times. Many routine banking tasks that had been handled by bank tellers are now handled by ATMs. Bank customers, for example, make deposits or withdrawals from checking and savings accounts at ATMs. They can also make payments on bank loans or transfer money from one account to another automatically. What are the advantages of using an ATM? You may not have time to stand in line at the bank, or you may need the money after the bank closes. Most ATMs operate 24 hours a day, making them convenient for customers. ATMs are convenient for the bank, too, because fewer tellers are needed. In fact, some banks now charge a fee to customers who rely on tellers for transactions that can be handled by ATMs. Some banks make it possible for you to pay bills without writing checks. Of course, you will still have to supply the money, but your bank will transfer funds automatically. Banks do this through Automatic Clearinghouse Services, or ACH, a system that transfers money from a customer's account to those of his or her creditors. Usually, ACH is used to pay regular monthly bills, such as home mortgage payments and rents, insurance premiums, and utility bills. Why might you decide to pay your bills through Automatic Clearinghouse Services? You would save time as well as money on postage and would have fewer envelopes to seal and you would know that your payments will arrive on time. Have you seen someone pay for gasoline or groceries by running a plastic card through an electronic scanner? Customers are able to purchase items in this way at gas stations, grocery stores, and convenience stores that have point-of-sale terminals. A point-of-sale transaction involves a direct transfer of money from a buyer's bank account to a seller's bank account. The buyer pays for goods at the checkout counter by inserting a plastic card, called a debit card, into a terminal. Money is then transferred automatically from the buyer's account to the seller's account. By mid-2019, more than 750,000 point-of-sale terminals were in use across the United States. How do point-of-sale transactions benefit you? A debit card requires you to use a personal identification number, or PIN. Without knowing this PIN, the card is useless, thereby reducing the problems caused by theft. You also can check the amount of money available in your account anytime you want by inserting your card into a point-of-sale terminal. Some banking experts believe that the use of debit cards soon will replace the use of checks in the U.S. economy. They note that debit cards help merchants by ending the risk of bad checks and eliminating the inconvenience and expense of processing credit card transactions. The use of debit cards, however, has some drawbacks. For example, debit cards can be used only in stores with the terminals. In addition, consumers are accustomed to the grace period, or lag time, offered by credit cards. 
When consumers make a credit card purchase, they do not have to pay for the good or service until they are billed for it. This period of credit that allows a purchaser to buy now and pay later is the grace period. Consumer lose their grace period with debit cards because a point of sale transaction transfers money out of their accounts instantly. Debit card means you buy now and pay now. One of the most dramatic developments in banking involves the internet. Many banks offer a variety of services to internet customers. For example, Citizens Bank, headquartered in Indiana, opens accounts over the internet for customers who are unable to come to one of the bank's branches. Georgia State Bank offers similar services, and Wilbur National Bank in New York permits customers to download software for banking transactions and bill payment. In California, the Bank of Stockton allows customers to download and reconcile their account statements, transfer funds, and pay bills through the internet. Even more popular than internet banking are telephone and home banking. For example, Bank One offers its customers in Texas the opportunity to check account balances, transfer money, and even apply for loans over the telephone. Electronic home banking services link personal computers and homes with the bank's computers. Bank records can be accessed by a customer's computer, enabling the transacting of bank business from home. Home banking provides convenience to customers and helps banks by reducing the time and money spent recording transactions. The second major trend is deregulation, or the reduction of government restrictions. Deregulation has resulted in more competition in banking, as well as the rise of interstate or regional banking in the United States. Banking deregulation began in 1980, when Congress passed the Depository Institutions Deregulation and Monetary Control Act. This act eliminated many of the traditional differences between financial institutions such as commercial banks and SNLs. In effect, the portions of the act that concern inter interest rates, checking accounts, and required reserves made banking both more competitive and more uniform in the services offered. Suppose that you decide to buy a car. Traditionally, you would have arranged a loan from an SNL or a credit union. Deregulation has allowed banks to offer interest rates comparable to those available from other institutions so you have many more loan offers from which to choose. Similarly, traveler's checks were once only issued at banks. Today, however, vacationers have the convenience of buying traveler's checks at almost any financial institution. Another major change as a result of deregulation has been the growth of regional banking. Historically, banks and their branches have been limited by law to their home states. In 1985, however, the Supreme Court affirmed that the states, not just the federal government, have a role in regulating regional banks. This ruling allowed banks to merge with other banks and to build branch offices in other states whose state legislatures were agreeable to the expansion. Would you prefer to do business with a local bank or with one based in a different state? Many banking experts view the trend toward regional banking as beneficial, primarily because larger financial institutions can offer a wider variety of services to its customers. Other experts foresee problems with regional banking, for example, that larger banks from distant regions may be unresponsive to customers' needs. In addition, smaller banks fear that the larger bank's greater size gives them a competitive edge in the market. Small banks also worry that they might be absorbed by larger banks, even when wishing to remain independent. Larger banks generally support the expansion of regional banking to full interstate banking, or nationwide banking. Nationwide banking would allow any bank to open branches and to merge with banks in any state. Supporters argue that national banking would create more competitive markets. Further, they note that bigness in the banking industry would allow it to benefit from economies of scale.
The third major banking trend of recent years is the stabilization of financial institutions. The need for increased stability could be seen in three main areas, loan defaults, bank failures, and what became known as the savings and loan crisis. During the 1980s, many people and businesses relied heavily on borrowed money. In some cases, they were unable to repay the funds they had borrowed. This failure to make payments on a loan is called a default. Although loan defaults occurred in many parts of the economy, there were a particularly large number of defaults among farmers. The Farm Credit System, or FCS, a network of 37 banks that offer loans to farmers nationwide through so-called farm banks, suffered from a wave of loan defaults in the 1980s. Many farmers were unable to make payments on property and equipment that had been purchased with FCS credit. Although the farm credit system at that time was the largest farm lender in the United States, with about $61.5 billion in outstanding loans, the organization was on the verge of bankruptcy in 1986. Loan defaults and other financial worries led to more bank failures in the 1980s than in any decade since the Great Depression. A bank fails when it no longer has enough assets on deposit to cover its accounts. Between 1980 and 1985, the annual number of FDIC-insured banks that failed rose from 11 to more than 100. Added to this total are the numerous near failures in banks in serious financial trouble. Perhaps the most viable sign of instability in U.S. banking during the 1980s involved savings and loan associations. A number of factors contributed to the SNL crisis. First, borrowers failed to make payments on many loans granted by SNLs in the early 1980s. This situation caused some savings and loan associations to fail and others to be absorbed by larger financial institutions. Another factor contributing to the SNL crisis was that some SNLs had only private insurance. About 30 states approved private depository insurance during the mid 1980s which allowed state-chartered SNLs to choose private insurance instead of insurance provided by the Federal Savings and Loan Insurance Corporation, or FSLIC. By 1986, nearly 18% of the nation's SNLs had chosen private insurance. In some states, however, private insurance plans lacked the financial resources needed to handle SNL failures. In response, in 1989, President George H.W. Bush signed the Financial Institutions Reform, Recovery, and Enforcement Act. This act addressed several aspects of the banking industry, but focused primarily on SNL reform. The act abolished the FSLIC and established the Resolution Trust Corporation, or RTC, to stabilize additional SNLs in danger of collapse. By August of 1994, the RTC had straightened out more than 730 SNLs and was overseeing 11 additional SNLs. By 1996, the RTC had been dissolved and deposit insurance for savings and loan institutions was provided by the FDIC, with the tab picked up by U.S. taxpayers. In 1996, the total cost of the SNL bailout was estimated at nearly $150 billion plus interest. One economics reporter pointed out that if the money had not been needed for the bailout, it could conceivably have paid for 57,692 M1 Abrams tanks, seven times the number used by the U.S. Army at the time. The beginnings of the most recent financial troubles in banking began in the late 1990s and early 2000s, as housing prices steadily increased. These were the direct result of the relaxation of lending requirements to individuals who were looking to buy homes. Banks stopped holding mortgages, the name given to home loans, for the life of the loans, which usually lasted 20 to 30 years. 
Instead, these banks sold bundles of these home loans to companies that looked to turn these mortgages into easy profits for their investors. As a result of these profits, banks offered more mortgages at even lower standards, leading prices in the housing market to increase. In early 2007, the real estate bubble, which had been building as these mortgage-backed securities caused the housing market prices to increase, suddenly burst, causing a financial crisis that affected not only the United States, but the world. The mortgage-backed securities began losing money, and banks worried that the home loans they issued would not be repaid. Foreclosures, or the repossession of a house when the mortgage borrower cannot pay the home loan back, increased. Many nationally known banks failed due to the loss of repayment. In 2008, the federal government bailed out some banks deemed too big to fail, those that would cause a further negative economic impact, and Congress passed several pieces of legislation that increased regulation of the banking system. So that's the way it is with Lesson 7, Part 5, U.S. Banking Today. At this point, you should know that the four main types of financial institutions are commercial banks, savings and loan associations, mutual savings banks and credit unions, technological advances have led to automated banking, federal deregulation has led to competition and reorganization of the banking industry, and poor lending practices and shaky insurance programs contributed to the collapse of many financial institutions in recent American history. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel to have the entire catalog of economics videos available at your fingertips. Click the subscribe button and then click the follow bell to receive notifications as to when the channel is updated. Thanks for watching and I'll catch you in class dragons.